All right, turn your Bible to the book of Joshua. I always say that Joshua, if you want to find it, know where it's at. It's the beginning of a sentence. Joshua judges Ruth. And we're going to look at the battle of AI. AI is significant because when you read in Genesis, God's call to Abraham into the promised land, we see that when he got there, it says that Abraham built an altar unto the Lord between Jericho and Ai. I think it's significant that the altar was built there. Over 400, maybe 500 years before there was even something or a people that was called Israelites. At that time, when Abraham built an altar to the Lord, the Israelites did not exist. Israelites were in the heart and the promise of God. And in Abraham's mind, he simply wanted a son. And God gave him a nation. In fact, today as we sit here biblically, we are all descendants of this man, Abraham. This story goes to the other side of the Battle of Jericho, which is very much noted. Because of the scheme God said for them to do, they simply marched around the city and went home. They did that six days. On the seventh day was the day that the walls came down a continuance, a shout to God, and the walls fell except for one section. You know, we've always heard all the walls fell down. They didn't. Because there was a, a lady named Rahab who was a harlot whose home was on the wall, and the spies that came from the Israelites spied out the land. And she hid them in Jericho because she said, I have heard of what the God you serve has done. And she asked them to promise her that her and her family would be saved. And they gave her that promise. In fact, there was a scarlet thread that was to be draped out of her window so that the armies would know where she lives. And in this sixth chapter after the battle we see that she and her family were safe because of her faith her belief in God Jericho was a great battle but Jericho and Ai serve as a very very wonderful uh, warning to us after sunshine comes a storm just as surely as after a storm comes sunshine. Because that's the way it is in life. I want you to know this morning, if you sit here and do not believe that you personally are in a war, and that this church is in a war, then you have been blinded. Uh, I'm not saying that we need to walk around in fear. We don't need to strap on our pistols like the Old West and get ready to shoot them up and take the law into our own self. I'm not talking about that. I've been in some countries of the world where we didn't wear T-shirts that said, I love Jesus. We didn't do anything that would bring attention to ourselves because there was war in that country and there was a war against God. We just simply walked cautiously. We walked with intelligence and we walked in the fear of the Lord. And today we need to realize that we do not need to try to buy a hundred acres of land and put a large wall around it and try to keep the world out. The world's inside every wall that's built. Neither do we want to be afraid to go outside. We don't need to walk in fear. We just need to realize that we have an enemy that desires to see you crushed and defeated and as many souls possibly spend eternity in hell with him, eternally separated for God. And it has nothing to do with Satan's hatred for you, except if you are a believer. Satan hates God. 
And the way that you get to the heart of God is through his creation. And so he is at war against his creation individually as believers. And he is at war against the church, that which God created to go into battle. We as a church need to realize the battle and the people, the people of this world are not those that we fight against. We lose all hope of people when we set ourselves up so sanctimonious, right, and perfect that we begin to look down at other people and just say, thank God, I'm not like that one. And you see, there's an example of that in the Word of God because a publican, a very plain guy, was in the temple praying, and this great religious man was praying next to him. The publican, the sinner, just beat his chest and said, Oh God, have mercy on me. And yet this great religious man, the, the power of the word himself, just simply said, I'm thankful I'm not like that guy. We fight wars. That's why we have prejudice. That's why we have racial problems. It's why we have hatred. It's the thing that drives a wedge into the heart of God, and it drives a church into a fortress that cannot be entered rather than a fighting army that does street battle every day with this cross on us that does not stand for the fact that we are medical in the sense of medical doctors, but it's a cross of Jesus Christ. It's the only hope for this world. Jericho's walls fell. Now, when they got, began to go into the promised land, God gave Joshua and the people some instructions. I'm reading from chapter 6, uh, verse 18 says, But you keep, your things, keep yourselves from the things devoted for destruction, least when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things, and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and for, to bring trouble upon. All the silver, gold, and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy, that is, devoted to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Verse 21, they followed his instruction. They devoted all of the city to destruction. Both men, women, young, old, oxen, sheep, donkeys, with the edge of the sword. Verse 24, after they had taken Rahab to, and her relatives to the outside of the camp of Israel, they burned the city with fire, everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and irons, did they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord Two things jump out at you. There were things that were devoted for destruction, and there were things that were devoted to God, and the instructions was one instruction to the Israelite people. Do not touch them. Those things devoted for destructions, as God would go into this land inhabited by people who worshipped every god, the abomination of their worship, their lives, the way they treated people, the way they burnt children uh, to their god, Molech. Everything in this country was simply sinful. You see, we get a picture of what God thinks about sin. It's this. Everything sin touches corrupts it. You cannot... You cannot make a peaceful coexistence with sin. You know, I was raised in the generation of the Cold War. Uh, we had real smart instructions like, in case of a nuclear bomb, if you're in school, get under your desk. I, I never figured that out, even as a kid. If this bomb's as bad as they say it is, and this desk is as rickety as I know it is, what is this task going to do for me? But yes, see, that's how we, we said we're planned. 
we're going to save our children. We say, children, get under your desk, and when the bomb destroys everything else, you and that desk will be okay. <laughs> we blinded our own eyes just simply to move away what was the real threat. You can't coexist with it. You can't agree to it. You can't like it. You've either got to be against it or against God. I said several weeks ago, we have to move to the point where we learn how to hate things that are necessary to hate. We hate Satan and we hate the things that are brought on by Satan. Simply because he is the antithesis of all that God is. So God said, these things are devoted to me. You bring them into treasury. They had no idea that one day a tremendous temple would be built in this city they had yet to conquer, but God did, and he's making provisions. For everything else, it was detestable, it was an abomination, and God said, destroy it. And in the battle of Ai, they did. Next up, Ai. In the middle of where Abraham built his altar. Go with me to chapter 7. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against Achan. The Bible didn't say that. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people. What you do affects everybody around you. This theology of the world that we all figure out for ourselves what's right, what's wrong. And you don't condemn what's right for me, even if it's not right for you, because we live in this somehow Disney world where everybody can think like they want to, do like they want to, and no one will be harmed. Think about that. I told a guy one day, this may not be very spiritual, but he made me mad, his ignorance. I said, do you mean to tell me I have a right, if I don't like you, to pull out my gun and just shoot you? And he looked at me. He said, well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, no, wait a minute. You just said that whatever you think is right is okay for you, and whatever I think is right is okay for me. So where does this madness end? Because everything we do affects the people that are around us. Let me tell you, sin in the family destroys the family. It destroys the strength of that family, the unity of the family, the witness of the family, and the effectiveness of the family. And when the family is affected, the city of the nation is affected because sin in the nation destroys the nation. It destroys the strength of the nation, the unity of the nation, the witness of the nation, and the effectiveness of the nation. We're living in a result of families that have lived in sin, and the sin of those families is spreading so that the culture, the very thing that God based, go back to Genesis. God created everything he created. Then he created marriage between a man and a woman. And he said, go forth, replenish the earth. Have children inhabit the earth. The very foundation of this world, the foundation of the nations were men and women who decided they would not be under the bondage of a king who told them what to believe and a church that put down all of the rules and regulations. So they set sail to this place, a place created by God for a God-fearing nation based on the the blessings of God and the laws of God. And it has not been destroyed from the outside. 
Remember the fat guy with the bald head from Russia? His name was Nikita Khrushchev. He was kind of childish. He was in a meeting one time, and he took his shoe off and just beat on the table just to get attention. Then he made a very prophetic statement. He said, I will take over this country without firing a shot. I'll get you from within. And we need to know the warfare that we're fighting. The spiritual realm in which we live begins in the family. And from that family, it spreads to the nation and friends. The thing, same thing that happens in a family, the same thing that happens in a nation, happens in the church. Sin, unconfessed sin in the life of the body of Christ absolutely causes it to lose its strength in witness into the community we are to go into. It will kill the unity and it will render a church ineffective. Do you realize that right now across the United States, 800 churches a year are closing? And from some of them that I've read about, it's like, thank God they're gone because a church did not exist to build some temple, some type of surrounded race of holiness. The church was a campground in order to gain strength and unity together and go where it was created in the streets of Benal and Palm Coast and Flagler Beach and Ormond Beach. The church was birthed, it was raised, and it was made for the streets. And a church that is not in the streets with an effective witness of reaching, helping, and sharing the gospel is nothing more than another religious uh, institution which we absolutely have no more need of. The church was created to be the light of this world. It was created to be the seasoning, the salt, the preservative, the healing. And when that ceases, it will cease because the church condones sin. You know something, we, I was thinking this week and I called a pastor friend of mine and we had one of our pastor conferences. And we said this, we, we pray diligently to seek the word of God, a message from God. And we preach. And we often wonder, did anybody hear us? <laughs> because we see no movement. Understand something. The Word of God is preached for a reason. The Word of God is preached to free us from what causes us to be afraid to be dependent on God. You see, if we were to grab someone and pray at an altar, if we were to do things like sharing needs in our life. I have this weakness. I have this problem. Will you pray with me and walk with me? We're afraid to do that because there's a greater sin in the church and that's the sin of Phariseeism where we think, all of us, that we're a little bit better than everybody else. Our little section of holyhood, we've got it and those other people, they're the ones that need it. When in reality, God give us the blessedness of forgiveness through the cross of Jesus. He's saying, I know when you live in this world, you're going to be tempted and tried. You're going to fail. But understand, as sure as that cross stands high, as sure as it is bloodstained, and as sure as Jesus Christ is making intercession for us, I want to clean you up just like you would clean a wound. I want to cleanse your inside. I want to renew your mind. I want you to be able to walk in the midst of a war-torn nation, a war-torn world where enemies of Satan is on every side and know that my hand is on you to walk secure, to be unafraid, and to stand as my light. See, that's why Israel was going in. They were to be the ones that 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 preached the message in their purity of their life of the one true God. Do you remember in Egypt? All of those miracles and those plagues that came from them, that wasn't just stuff that God was putting on Egypt. Every one of the plagues 
represented a god that Egypt worshipped. And in a sense, God was saying to Moses, put me in a contest as to which god is God. And God delivered it. Sure, it's when Moses threw his staff down, it turned into a serpent. Those wicked, evil, devil-filled sorcerers threw their, their staff, and it turned into a serpent. But there wasn't a war. Moses' serpent eat all of their serpents, proving once and for all there is one true God. And if there's ne ever a time in this world with the influx of foreign religions that have now become a part of our political system and our every day, we're supposed to just love everybody regardless of what their stand is. If there's a time, one true God, a God of love and compassion, but yet a God of judgment that needs to go into the community to the sick and dying, deceived people, it's right now. It's right now. Because sin brings destruction on a nation, on a community, in a family. It is destructive. And the only medicine is the Word of God. That's the only cure. It's a cure for every aching heart here this morning that wishes in your circumstances certain things were better. The Word of God. You see, Israel did something. They touched and kept for themselves this one man, as illustrated by the nation, things that were devoted for destruction. He said, well, what does that mean, preacher? We're, you know, we're not going to go raid a castle today. Every sin needs to be devoted to destruction. Remember a while ago I said we can't get cozy with it? Too often, hey, I stand here as, a, as one has walked down a path. If I'm not careful, I'll just cozy up to it and say, look, you don't mess with me, I won't mess with you, we just live life, everything's going to be good. And we overlook it because I look out there and there's Paul. <laughs> I'm better than Paul in some of these things, so, hey, whew, well, I'm glad I saw Paul today. I feel much better about myself. We live that way whether you admit it or not. We baby our sin. My favorite story is a guy in the frozen tundra walked out one day and he saw a serpent. And it was frozen. And he had compassion on that serpent. And he took it home and he went in the house and he built this fire. And at night when he would lay down and sleep, he would lay the serpent's frozen body next to his chest and wrap up in covers. And he would walk around in his cabin during the day with that serpent up against his chest and wrapped in blankets. And finally one night, the serpent began to, to come back alive. He began to move and he raised his head up and the man looked at him and the serpent sucked his fangs in his chest, injected the venom and killed him. Before he died, he looked at the serpent. He said, I found you frozen. I gave you nothing but care and compassion. Why did you kill me? And the serpent said, because I'm a serpent. And that's what serpents do. It's time we realize not just the ugliness of sin, but the destructiveness of sin. When we plant the seeds of an unforgiving life, covering sins, you plant seeds of disobedience and destruction in your family. You, you may be planting a generational crop that can only be overcome through the grace of God. Same thing in the nation, in the church. When we plant, instead of being honest. See, they, they had this meeting, and you can read chapter 7. They went through this and the lot fell on Achan as he walked by them. And in verse 19 of chapter 7, Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord of Israel and praise him to him. 
tell me now what you have done and do not hide it from me. Listen to Achan's words. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. In your Bible, write, devoted the shekels of silver, the bar of gold, devoted to God. It wasn't his to touch. He saw a cloak from Shinar. That's a cloak that a king or royalty will wear. That is what's devoted for destruction. He said, I coveted them, I took him, and they were hidden in the earth beside my tent with the silver devoted to God with him. James, in writing the letter, said this, let no one say he is tempted. When he is tempted, to say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot tempt with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured, enticed by his own desire. Then sin, desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. I saw, I coveted, I touched. Last week I talked about you are bought with a price. Your life is not your own. If you'll think with me a minute, God formed you in your mother's womb. And the fact that you are sitting here today shows that you survived the nine months and the birth procedure in your life. For some here who are believers in Christ, there came a day when Jesus Christ came into your life. He began to speak into your life. And he called you out of that sin. He called you out of that dead life. And you were reborn in a new life. All by Christ. Every day we live, we're not our own. We're bought. And yet the beautiful thing about this purchase is that God then writes our emancipation proclamation to walk in the freedom of the Spirit of God, which in itself is a gift of God, to guide our way, the Bible, as a road map. Everything that you have as a believer, listen to me, that I have as a believer is devoted to God. Now, you may not like to think about it because you say, my time is my own. I have to work. I have this. I have that. I, I, I try to make time for Bible reading. I try to make time for church. Listen, your time, 24 hours a day, is God's. He gives it to you. It's a gift of God because you're sitting here breathing this morning. So what does that mean? Do we spend all of our time camped here? I hope not. I'm not going to spend all my time here. It just means that everywhere you go, you're taking Christ with you. You're using your time wisely. Mark uses it wisely as he leads deputy sheriffs and uh, gives protection to our land, our other Mark and Ryan. They, they give their time as they deal with people's lives, but yet it is God's time. And it, when, when they walk away from situation, they've left God's mark. And it's the same thing with any of us. Our time is God's. We don't take it and say, ah, this is mine. We need to understand every possession and every dollar, every penny you have is not yours. There is no such thing as a self-made man. The only way one we've ever heard about was in, the, was in the New Testament in a parable of Jesus. This guy looked at it, said, I am prosperous by all means. I've got old barns that are following. I'm going to tear them down. I'm going to build bigger barns because I have done well. And I'm going to say, eat, drink, and be merry 
and enjoy the fruit of my life. And God said this night, tonight, your life is mine. You see, somebody mentioned one time, preacher, I don't hear a lot of tithing messages out of you. Well, I'd rather have a, a, a church full of people who give to the Lord out of the bounty and blessing of their life than hold you to 10% measure. Because when Christ come, he didn't do away with the tithe. He just said, as God blesses you, as God blesses you, you give back to God. So the measure of our giving is a measure of the blessings that we've received from God. That is devoted to God. You don't mess with it. How much is that? I don't have any idea. You get on your knees, you talk to God. Whatever y'all decide, we'll be happy. And we'll be able to reach further, reach brighter with the gospel of Christ. The vocation you have, the talents and ability you have, the gifts of the Spirit are of absolutely no use anywhere else except when the body of Christ meets together. It is dangerous to take of the world the things that are devoted to destruction, and that is everything that will lead us away from the presence of God. Everything that will cause us to walk without this sense of clean hands and pure heart. I love that statement because it doesn't say walk and be perfect. It says clean hands and a pure heart. That means just like at any time I get my hands dirty, I can go wash them. And at any time that we said may fall in any way, regardless down before God, oh God, I confess this. I don't want this in my life. Forgive me. And, and, and God will say to you, look, <laughs> you remember when Jesus came to earth? He got on that cross and he stretched out his hands. He was bloody and marred, but he took on every sin you could ever, ever commit in your life before any of us were born before we ever committed a sin. God's call to you is simply come get what Christ paid for. It's here. It's available. And the most dangerous sin in a person who is afraid to step forth and say, I want to follow Christ for fear, quote, I won't be able to do it. The greatest thing to devote to destruction is that statement. Because God never called anyone to live the life of Christ on his own. There's not a list of the things that you can do and be okay. You know why I know that? Because the Bible says it is by grace through faith you have been saved, not of works, least anyone should boast it's all of God you got to put away that destructive thing which is your unbelief I told a man one time he said well you know I like to drink I like to party I like to do this he gave me a pretty good list and I said you know what that's not keeping you away from God he kind of looked at me I said, yeah, you know, sins like that just kind of turn the, the oven up in hell. Makes it hotter. The thing that keeps you from God is unbelief that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, can do what he says he will do, and will do what he says he will do, which is forgive your sins to the utmost. And when you come to him, you don't worry about what you can and can't do. Because without Christ, none of us can do anything. I wrote some things down. If you'll bear with me, I'd like to read them. They're good. Because I want to encourage you this morning, believer. You know, when the disciples found that God was, you know, Jesus died and he was in a grave. Jesus appeared one of them. In Luke 22, 24, he says, ask a question. Why are you troubled? 
Why do doubts arise in your heart? You know what he was talking about? They're sitting there crying. And he's alive. And before he died, he said, look, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be, I'm going to rise. I'm going to die, but I'm going to live. I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised from the dead. So he said, why are you troubled? Why do you doubts in your heart? Isaiah, we find the words, what do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by God. Do we walk around saying God doesn't see me somehow? I live in this shelter just because no one knows. God doesn't know. The Lord cares for everything, and even the smallest creature in his universal providence, but he cares particularly for his saints. Because in the Psalms, we find the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. How do you live a Christian life? How do you go out of this church and on Monday face the world for Monday? Face your family? Face your situations in life? The angel of the Lord, which is a reference to Jesus Christ, encamps. He is around you. It goes further than that. Precious is in, is the, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You say, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not wanting to get a load up and go to heaven now. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Do you realize that when God sees this one who has lived life, oh, we, share, we, we shed tears because we're going to miss that company. We're going to miss that love and that memory. But God looks at that and says, that saint is forever with me an internal inheritance. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called to his purpose. We know that the fact that he is the savior of all men, God died for the world, but at the same time, he is the savior of all who receive him. You see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a great promise. But you want know me to tell you how it's better? It's when each one of you say, God so loved me. Call your name. Because that takes it from the, the largeness of this world down to where you live. He loved you, Paul. You, Jimmy. You, Bill. He loves you. And that makes all the difference in the world. That lotto everybody's so concerned about. That's for everybody. But it only means something to the one that gets it, right? Salvation is much, much. Can't even be defined by those lowly numbers. Oh, you're in his care. You're his royal treasure. He guards you as the apple of his eyes. He says even the hairs of your head are numbered. <laughs> you don't have to count far from me and Paul. I mean, but he says they're numbered. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. You think about that. The lie of the devil is this. God will put you somewhere that you're in danger. He'll put you somewhere and you won't know what to say. He'll put you in some situation that will cause you to lose something. He said, I will never. And when God says never, he's the only one that can say that word and mean it to the uttermost. How many times have we said, I'll never do this? I've learned don't ever do it because that's next on your agenda. Because God's going to show you, you'll do what I tell you to do. Fear not, I'm your shield, and your reward shall be very great. And then the one that I love. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith do not fail. He said that to a guy named Peter. Denied Christ. Cursed. On the night Christ, the greatest tragedy in his life was happening. Jesus foretold that a little beforehand. He said, Peter, you're going to forsake me. Satan wants to sift you. 
but I prayed for you. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the greatest intercessor in the world? The Bible says he is forever making intercession before the Father on our behalf. The tragedy of the body of Christ is that we will ask prayer requests from everyone, and that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is twofold. Sometimes we have not even prayed over it ourselves. We just, will you pray for this? And secondly, we don't go to Father and say, this is something I need you praying about. This, this is a prayer I need from you. Friends, let me tell you something. In this life, the life that you will meet, maybe within minutes, maybe within hours, next week, you're going to come across things that are devoted for destruction because they will absolutely destroy your life. Sometimes it can be a quick destroying. Sometimes it can be like a slow-eating cancer, but it'll destroy your life. Sin has no good in it. Every seed, seed that is planted from sinful seeds bears multitudes of fruit of evil. And there are things that are devoted to God. And when we live our lives understanding those two things, our lives will be a lot better. And the final point is this. I didn't read you. They sent spies into Ai and pride multitude itself. Spies come back and said, Joshua, don't worry about it. <laughs> this is a small city. Y'all just stay home. Send about 3,000 guys. We'll whip these guys and be back for supper. And they went, and they were defeated. In chapter 8, you hear the instructions of the Lord. Joshua, get everybody together. You know why? So that no one group could take credit. Do you know why I always pray that everything that we do, every member of this church is there? Because we multiply the resources of the word and the witness of God. It's not like I just want you to go do a lot of stuff. Yesterday in the parking lot, there was so much witnessing going on. Catherine couldn't even get out of her car. I, I, I tell you, 30 minutes, listening to a man pour out his heart for some reason. Over and over, there were people that we were able to talk to. If we'd had more people, we would have talked more. That's why I want to muster an army. Because all of them got together and went back to AI. Wiped it out. Lessons to be learned. Keep your hands off the things that are devoted to the Lord. Keep your hands off the things that are devoted to Satan and understand you're not an island. We're of greater power together than we are individually. Would you bow your head this morning? Father, thank you for your word is true. We don't have to figure out a way to make it better because we couldn't. When your word promises us freedom now and forever, when your word promises that if we come to you, you will not reject us, and your word promises that when we fall into sin, as we all will because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, if we seek the forgiveness that's available, Father, we remove the weight that is dragging us down, trying to completely cause us to throw up our hands in despair. Christ, you are available this morning. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would call to this morning those that you are speaking to, grant them boldness to make that stand for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.